It's the Maxwell Institute Podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. When the Protestant reformer John Calvin published his book, Institutes of the Christian Religion, in the 1500s, he couldn't have anticipated ahead of time the incredibly different purposes his book would come to serve long after he died and was buried somewhere in an unmarked grave by his own request. The Institutes was a blockbuster in Calvin's day, but why, hundreds of years later, did it wind up playing a part in debates about apartheid in South Africa? How did the exact same book managed to help some people justify racial discrimination on one hand, but also help others powerfully oppose it on the other. Bruce Gordon is here to answer that question. He's talking about his new biography of John Calvin's Institutes. It's the latest in Princeton University Press's Lives of Great Religious Book series, and we're glad to have him on the Maxwell Institute podcast. Questions and comments about this and other episodes can be sent to mipodcast at byu.edu. We're speaking today with Bruce Gordon. He is the Titus Street Professor of Ecclesiastical History at Yale Divinity School. His books include a biography of Calvin and a book called The Swiss Reformation. But today we're talking about his latest book. It's a biography of John Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion. It's part of Princeton University Press's Lives of Great Religious book series. Uh, Bruce, thanks so much for taking your time to come on the Maxwell Institute podcast today. It's a great pleasure to be here. I wanted to set the stage with the state of religion at the time of John Calvin with the Reformation. Before we get to Calvin himself, let's set the historical stage. So take us to the first decade of the, of the 1500s when Calvin was born. What did Christianity look like at the time? I think one of the things that uh, is misunderstood is that it's often said that, you know, the late Middle Ages was a time of great decay, of decline of r religion, of corruption. It was the but Dark it, Ages, right? It was the Dark Ages, exactly. But what, you know, Calvin would have found in, in the world of the early 16th century is a church was extraordinarily diverse, that in some areas extremely vital. We look at, at England, where parish churches were being built all over the place. There was great signs of life. In other places, such in Germany... Uh, there was decline. This, the picture was extremely uh, diverse. But what you also would find is extraordinary devotion, levels of devotion. The churches were full of uh, statues, full of worshippers, images, painted walls. Uh, so that it, this idea that it was in decline is, is really quite hard to sustain. Nevertheless, with the Reformation, which we associate with Martin Luther, whose uh, anniversary is being celebrated next year in 2017, something extraordinary happened. Luther put his finger on a problem that many people were recognizing, that there was corruption within the church and that people were being asked essentially through the purchasing of indulgences to pay for their salvation. And he struck a rich theme of anti-clerical sentiment. And the reaction of the Catholic Church against Luther, which said, you know, this, uh, this obscure uh, monk and professor at university has no right to raise these uh, objections, stirred a lot of people into thinking that there was a serious problem with the church. Luther's own role in this was absolutely crucial. He began to identify the church as uh, being occupied by Antichrist, thinking about Rome. His own position grew and grew as he articulated an idea of how the church should be reformed. And crucial to this, of course, was the printing press. Luther's image was everywhere. His words spread and people were persuaded that there was a problem. So I would say that the role of the individual transformed what had been a fairly lively religious culture into something else. He had persuaded them that there was a serious problem and a serious mistake. So the Luther affair then attracted many other people who found in going back to scripture that many of the things he was saying were right, they were, they were compelling. And so he was, found himself at the center of a great storm which attracted many other leading figures and a revolution was started. With Luther, how much would you say he was a precipitator of uh, Reformation ideas and how much was he more of a manifestation of what was already cooking? Uh, a little bit of both, but probably more of, of the first. He picks up on ideas that are already circulating in the late Middle Ages. People, of course, are reading scripture. They see what's in Paul's letter to the Romans about questions such as justification and grace. But Luther takes them to a, a new level. He really does 
uh, in his writings and in his preaching give a new expression which is highly uh, attractive and it takes all sorts of people back to scripture so he he is really at the front of this and really is the center of the storm and you mentioned the printing press so there's a pretty robust body of literature that began to be published and circulating mm -hmm. here and the institutes of the christian religion which john calvin wrote mm -hmm. is people think of it as such a huge book today it's it's really had staying power but it was actually just part of a wider stream of literature as the reformation moved from sort of being a a breakthrough and perhaps not even initially intended to be a break away from the catholic church uh, yeah. but it then became its own sort of establishment which then had its own kind of schisms how did the literature reflect those shifts, and how, how did John Calvin's book fit into that? Well, already in the 1520s, uh, you know, there are splits developing because Luther articulates a view of the sacraments, and one of the people who emerges just about at the same time, who was originally highly influenced by, by Luther, a man named uh, Ulrich Zwingli, uh, takes the looking goes back to scripture just as Luther has said sola scriptura and he sees a very different teaching on the Lord's Supper on the sacrament so right in the 1520s there's a extraordinary split the so-called Anabaptists or radicals are seeing scripture in very different ways the peasants who rebel in 1525 are saying well we thought we were following Luther we're following from scripture and Luther says no absolutely not so the splits are right there in the 1520s when John Calvin uh, emerges with his writing in 1536, he sees that as contributing to a wider body of literature. It's not a standalone work. Uh, he hopes that it will contribute to the discussions of the emerging Protestant doctrine, also will address some of the wounds that are, have been exposed within the Protestant uh, camp. So the Institutes, right from its beginning in the 1530s through to its final versions, was always part of a wider body of literature with which Calvin was in conversation with. So we've kind of seen the state of the church here. You mentioned the sale of indulgences and some of the issues that Reformation figures were objecting to. Theologically, some of the ideas uh, that were circulating at the time. Um, I'm thinking of the relationship between God and his creatures, the role yeah. of sin obscuring reality, um, yeah. and, and this sort of thing. Paint a little theological picture of sort of what the Christian plan of salvation, so to speak, looked like at the time of the Reformation that would play into uh, Calvin's book. Well, Calvin saw himself as inheriting these great ideas that emerged in the 1520s, the so-called sola or only, you know, scripture alone the idea of justification by faith alone, the center of which is that it is not human merit that brings one to salvation, that God does not judge us according to our own achievements or worthiness. But what Luther articulates, of course, following Augustine and a long tradition, is that salvation comes from the grace of God alone, that it is God who acts and that we respond uh, in gratitude and in worship. Uh, so this is the center of this, and this is the message of Scripture, and that Scripture alone and not the institution of the church is the source of authority. So that Luther and Calvin following him saw themselves as doing nothing other than interpreting the word of God, that there was no other uh, source. So Calvin follows in this, which emerges in Luther's great works of uh, 1520. Uh, those are the central uh, theological ideas from which we'll build uh, teaching on the sacraments and teaching on the church, the teaching on the Christian life, those very full doctrines which you know increasingly find expression in the, uh, the subsequent editions of the Institutes. So let's talk more about John Calvin, the person. There are a lot mm -hmm. of views and stereotypes of him um, that you mm -hmm. cover in the book throughout the life of his book. These include things like um, being a uh, an interpreter of the Bible, uh, an advocate of theocracy, or mm -hmm. the father of democracy, uh, mm -hmm. as the murderer of a, of a heretic, as mm -hmm. a gloomy <laughs> uh, precursor to the Puritans. Let's talk about some of these stereotypes and where they come from and, and what they suggest. Well, a lot of them come from uh, his contemporaries, uh, many of whom uh, disliked him intensely and named him 
as being this cold, distant, uncaring figure. In fact, there's a letter from Calvin in which he says, you know, this is how my opponents continually portray me. Uh, but, you know, I am a person who loved my wife. I am a person who grieved for the loss of my child. Uh, that Calvin was, in many ways, an austere figure. He, you know, he rose early in the morning. He worked extremely uh, uh, diligently uh, all day was devoted to the service of God. He had no sense of you know, leisure as, as we would think of it uh, now. Every moment of the day, including sleep, was to the glory of God, and he dedicated himself to this. Uh, and because of that, he could be extremely demanding on those who were around him because he expected much the same of them. But, you know, he valued friendship very highly. His correspondence is full of concern for the families of others. Uh, he, was a human, he was a human being, but he found himself in an extraordinarily difficult position, uh, head of the church in Geneva, which required enormous uh, uh, control and uh, uh, discernment. Uh, he was part of a wider international movement that he would cared for greatly, the spread of what he saw as the word of, of God. Uh, he did not tolerate those who gave only half you know, their efforts to the job. He demanded extremely uh, high standards. Um, and that resulted in an image of him being this austere bibliophile. But to read his works, and I would recommend, uh, for instance, his introduction to the book of Genesis, uh, you see that for him, the word of God, the Bible, was a source of great pleasure that he saw in it extraordinary beauty. The Bible was not some rule book for him, but it was the word of God, and it manifested the glory of God. And I think it's difficult for us and for those who simply have access to his words to get a sense of how for Calvin there was this extraordinary sense of uh, wonder. So he was difficult. He saw himself in the light of, of the prophets of the Old Testament. Uh, he saw himself with a particular calling to uh, Christ's church. Um, he was very demanding, but he was not humorless. Uh, he was known to enjoy uh, a drink with his friends in friendship. Uh, he, he just was a, a complicated individual, but one who was dedicated to the service of God, as he saw it. And in his dedication, one of the ways he wanted to spread that was by writing a book. And the book yes. we're talking about is Institutes of the Christian Religion. So let's let's talk a little bit about that, the factors that led him to write that book. Yes. Well, he writes the book uh, in, in its first version in 1536 as a complete unknown. And he sees it as... Uh, following from the work of Martin Luther, he adopts the structure of, of Luther's catechism. Uh, the book receives uh, extraordinary, uh, uh, really warm welcome. Uh, it brings Calvin to the notice of a large number of quite prominent individuals. But Calvin himself was not someone who uh, was satisfied with his efforts. He continually uh, strove to improve to expand, because he saw the Institutes as reflecting his ongoing work of the study of the Word, his service uh, to the Church. So it would continue to grow as his ministry, as his studies uh, expanded. But the book was moving towards what he wanted it to be, which was a sum of Christian doctrine. And he says in the 1559 edition that he, ex that he at least has achieved a state where he could be satisfied that this is what he's done. It was to be you know, what we could call a summary of Christian doctrine in which the doctrine was laid out in an orderly way following the word of God and was comprehensible to readers. How about its relationship to the Bible? I mean, Calvin was very dedicated to Scripture, so how did he see writings like his book and, and Martin Luther in, the, in, in comparison with Scripture? Yeah. Equal He's, status, different status? Not equal status, because it's, it is the, the Word of God is the Word of God, and that is the Bible. What the Institutes was to serve was never to be a replacement for the Word of God, but was to be part of the interpretation of the Word of God. It was to be an aid for uh, both candidates for ministry, uh, ministers in parishes, and also uh, lay people in its vernacular form to study the Bible. But it was never meant to take them away from the Bible. It's important, you spoke earlier about the relationship between the Institutes and other forms of writing. The Institutes for Calvin was to be seen together with his biblical commentaries. They were to be read side by side. 
because they did two related but separate things. The biblical commentaries followed line by line through scripture, explaining to the reader what was unfolding. The institutes had a different role. It was to outline what Calvin referred to as the doctrine of scripture. It was to teach what was the doctrine which is contained within scripture. So it, it pulled from scripture the teachings of God. So they were to be read alongside one another. They did two distinct things, but both were to serve the individual in understanding the word and never to replace the reading of the word itself. This seems to raise a question about authority, because one of the things mm -hmm. that reformers were concerned about was that the church was adding these layers onto scripture, that yeah. the Catholic church had scripture, but it also always had this idea of, of the tradition that the church uh, took care of, and, and it would be alongside and just as authoritative as scripture, right? So with the reformers, they, they also didn't find the Bible to necessarily be sufficient if they're writing these commentaries on it. So although they had this belief in sola scriptura, yet they were creating their own body of yes. tradition. Did they ever reflect on that paradox at all? Yes, absolutely. Uh, and their critics reflected on that paradox a great deal. Uh, critics who were within uh, the Protestant world, many of them said, you are re simply replacing the old orthodoxies here, that you are replacing the word of God with your own books of authoritative interpretation. And Calvin was extremely sensitive, not just Calvin, but all, that whole generation of reformers were extremely sensitive to this criticism. Uh, and their position was that the, uh, the, the theological works, as I said before, were not in any way to distract from the word of God, but served the interpretation of the Word of God, and also were not simply new works, but stood in the tradition of the wisdom of the Church, going back to Augustine and the Fathers of the Church, that they read that tradition profitably, drawing from it a great deal of, of learning, but always criticizing that learning in light of Scripture. So it, they are secondary forms of literature uh, which serve to help the church interpret the word. So that's the position they held. But as I say, their critics continually said, you are in many ways creating a new form of ecclesiastical authority. What the reformers wanted to say is it's not the Bible only, but the Bible alone, that, the, that you have this tradition of reading the Bible, which is informative, it's the wisdom of the church, but one must always have a critical relationship to it, but it is there and it is to be honored, but it is always subordinate to the word itself. So it sounds like a lot of the critics then were coming from a, ref, a reform-minded perspective of being skeptical about the sort of mm -hmm. additional authority that could be built up. How about within the Catholic Church? Did, did, did the church look upon these writings as subversive or contradictory to the tradition? Absolutely. And, and towards the end of his life, uh, Calvin was viewed by the Catholic Church as the number one enemy by the Council of Trent. It was no longer Luther. Calvin was seen as the most dangerous figure, not least of which because his institutes was such a popular work and so widely distributed uh, in, in Europe. But yes, their criticism was one that was slightly different. And there they saw that you had placed theology outside of uh, the church by, by emphasizing the interpretation of scripture uh, by individuals that what you created was a whole plethora of in theological interpretations so that when they looked at the Protestant world they said, well you people can't even agree amongst yourselves about all things, which just shows what the danger is when you allow people to interpret the Bible without the authority of the church. So you've created uh, chaos, and that you know, you have this one figure of Calvin who has a great deal of influence, but we see in other places people, the Lutherans disagreeing with him. So how do you bring those together? This is well, this is what you this is what this is the world that Luther has brought upon us. And you in the book you talk about how he intended he intended the institutes to be for um, lay readers, not not necessarily for clergy, but he wanted this to be an all access pass. 
Yes, absolutely. So that's why he created it both in its French version, uh, he uh, wrote in French, but also in Latin. The Latin was primarily for students of theology, those who were preparing to become pastors, uh, and for those who were already pastors, and of course it was also to be uh, read by theologians. But he put a great deal of effort into the uh, vernacular versions, the French versions of the Institutes, which were not entirely the same. He took out a lot of the references that were in the Latin version to make it more user-friendly. Uh, but very quickly in the 16th century, the Institutes is translated into English, it's translated into Dutch, into a range of other languages, so that lay people can be reading this work as well. So the Institutes has multiple lives. It is a book of instruction for, in theology and you know, the life of the church, but it is also a devotional work, uh, helping lay people, uh, women and men, to read the Bible with greater understanding. And you talked about how the church came to see Calvin as an even bigger opponent than Martin Luther. Um, this is something that you cover throughout the book, that there's a very close relationship between Calvin the person and his book, and that yes. these things get muddled throughout the history of the book's life. Talk about that for a minute. Yes, I mean, often, you know, when people are asked to name a book from the Reformation, they will say Calvin's Institutes. And then if you press again, uh, you'll say, well, what else did Calvin write? They will, they will say the Institutes. And, <laughs> and uh, um, he's seen as a bit of a one book wonder. Well, he's not. He, he wrote a great number of works throughout his life. And of course, he wrote voluminous biblical commentaries. But nevertheless, the Institutes has the been the book which has defined his character. And it's also, and this is one of the things I, I tried to, to look at in the book, is that it shaped very much the way people understood Calvin, but at the same time, the way people read the Institutes was, was greatly molded by what they thought of Calvin himself. So there is this relationship between uh, the individual and his book. But for many people, uh, decades and even centuries, uh, and thinking primarily in, from the 18th into the 19th century, when Calvin was not widely read, uh, the book was mentioned without people knowing much about it, but it was taken to represent the various, usually unpleasant uh, qualities that were associated with uh, Calvin himself. And really what happens in the 19th century, when you start to get editions of the Institutes appearing again, is that people are seeing that the book itself has many different dimensions to it. And with the growth of biographies of Calvin in the 19th century, we're seeing his life had many different dimensions to it. And the two were not exactly the same. That's Bruce Gordon. He's written a biography of Calvin called, appropriately enough, Calvin. Uh, he's also an author of a book about called The Swiss Reformation. Today we're talking about his new biography of John Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion. It's part of Princeton University Press's Lives of Great Religious Book series. So let's move to the Institutes itself, Bruce, uh, and talk about the first edition in 1536 opens with the, uh, with the declaration that the whole of sacred doctrine consists of two parts – knowledge of God and of ourselves. So the nature of knowledge seems to be a guiding theme in the Institutes, according to your book. And, and Calvin identifies a twofold knowledge. Let's talk about that idea of knowledge that he frames the book with. Yeah, I think it's it's very important to, to think about what he means by knowledge, because it's not entirely how we would respond to it in the first instance. It's, it's not simply that you something you learn about or you hear about, but this knowledge that Calvin opens the Institutes with uh, famously, the twofold knowledge form of, 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 of knowledge, is related to what God has revealed to us that our knowledge, our awareness, you can think of other terms, our sense, is to use a word that Calvin uh, likes very much, our sense of the divine has been revealed to us uh, by God. And the, the, so the, the whole of the relationship between God and humanity is defined by this reaching out of the divine to us. Now that knowledge will take different forms, uh, because in, in one way, it will go to all humanity, all will have a sense of the divine, but that for Calvin, it, has a, it takes a special form 
in Christ in that those who are, in Calvin's language, chosen or elect will have a full knowledge of, of, of the divine. How did this play into his doctrine of predestination? Because if knowledge is something that's given by God then, yeah. um, this speaks to a pastoral question that, yes. that seems to have driven the book. Why some believe and why some don't? Well, that's, you know, is the great question and, of course, a source of tremendous controversy, not only in, in Calvin's day, but ever since uh, uh, raged through uh, the 18th and 19th century uh, and into our own time. You know, why does, does Calvin speak of you know, what comes to be known as double predestination, that God has not only chosen those who will be, uh, who enter into paradise, but those who are the reprobate? And Calvin, you know, has there's many different forms of, of criticism to this, but that in particular, that what Calvin does in this is make God the author of evil. And that's something his, you know, his sharpest critics in his own day said that Calvin had created this tyrannical God, this God who, who without any sense of, uh, of rhyme or reason or justice, uh, condemns the vast majority of humanity to the fires of hell. Uh, and Calvin was res very aware that he had to respond to this. You see this in the 1559 Institutes, which has a very full treatment of predestination, um, in which he says that it is the, what is the will of God is good, and it is God's will that, some, that all are undeserving of God's grace, but it is God's goodness that it is extended to some and not to others. And why it goes to one person and not to another is something humans can simply not know. And he, he is fierce on the point that we must never speculate about who belongs to the elect and who belongs to the reprobate. Uh, he, he speaks, for instance, of in his commentary on Genesis of Lot's wife. Lot's wife is punished for turning back. But Calvin says, we do not know of her eternal fate. That is, belongs to God uh, alone. So he says, this is, this is a mystery to which our minds cannot uh, ascend, but it is a reality that God both uh, makes the eternal decision and that those who, uh, who, have been, who are being punished are so because of their own fault, because Calvin does not want to suggest that it is God's fault that they are condemned. He wants to hold together human responsibility, culpability for this. But these are the two that are in tension with each other, and he says it's simply a reality that's found in Scripture, and that's not for me to resolve why that is. So his was double predestination, the idea yes. that, that God created those who would be elect to salvation and those who would be damned to hell, and that that was God's sovereign decision from the beginning. Yes. What were other Reformation um, responses to that? Because there were other Reformation figures who didn't believe in double predestination. No. How did they reckon with it? No, I mean, uh, very important figures such as Philip Melanchthon, or I mean, one could say Luther itself does not really enter into this discussion. Uh, it's uh, Heinrich Bullinger, who was in some ways Calvin's closest colleague. He was the head of the church in Zurich. They worked together very closely. Um, they all did not accept this idea of double predestination because they felt that it stressed a tyrannical sounding God, although all of them advocated a doctrine of predestination, which was pretty much shared by all the Protestant reformers and all look back to Augustine and Aquinas on this point. Um, but they did not uh, accept the formulation of double and that they would say there was that God punishes uh, the uh, the damned, but we cannot know, first of all, cannot know who they are. And secondly, it is not God's will that they should be punished. One can only speak of God electing those to paradise whom God has chosen, but one cannot speak about God choosing those to perdition as a form of glorification of God's name. So it, it Calvin said this position was ridiculous. You, you, know, you can't have one without the other. Uh, and, it, and it is a very naughty, insensitive problem. Uh, but it's untied uh, by Calvin by saying that there are, are these two forms which belong together, and that's what Scripture teaches. If you hold to any form of single predestination, you can't find any basis for this in Scripture. So they disagreed on it. It's interesting that in behind, to, to simplify it into two 
different sides, and there were more than that. But Calvin ver- uh, double predestination versus people who kind of h- held to the single predestination idea behind both of those sides seems to be an appeal to mystery though. I mean, Calvin was grounding it in in his interpretation of scripture, but saying ultimately this is something that we can't understand. And it seems like his opponents could have just said the same thing. Like, yeah, the scripture may seem to say that to you, but there's a mystery here that, you know, did they appeal to mystery as well? Uh, Very much so. And and people like Bullinger and Calvin simply uh, would say, we agree that there is a doctrine of predestination, that that is found in Scripture, but the exact form in which it takes, we don't agree on, and we will leave that to you know, the next world. We're not going to. We're not going to try and resolve it. They knew they couldn't. They reached a point when this, you know, one party would take a particular view, uh, the other another. Um, but it was Calvin's double predestination which outraged people. This idea that the reprobate. Uh, were chosen by God is that that particular formulation that m- m- really made Calvin infamous for this doctrine. How important was correct belief on this kind of an issue to Calvin and to other reformers? Did they expect that you know that it would be a sign of election if you did believe in these certain ways, or did they think that these kind of beliefs just didn't pertain to salvation at all? They were sort of just things you could think about and wasn't important. Uh, Calvin believed that predestination was a subject that you could preach. Uh, from the pulpit, that the people should know about it, uh, that they should they should accept it. But it was also a pastoral issue above all for him. And I know that sounds odd to people uh, now, but for Calvin, it was a deeply pastoral issue in that he believed that the doctrine of election provided people with assurance that God would not ever abandon them, that it was assurance of God's promises of the covenant that was eternal. So therefore, that the predestination should be preached as something that would build up the community, would build up uh, the faithful. So it was very prominent in, in the life of the church. And people were to accept it in the sense that it was part of their uh, catechism. But it's not, it's not controversial, as far as I can tell, except when people openly deny it. That for that, you could get into difficulty. It also seems like in addition to the pastoral issue of it, I, I read a book by Peter Thiessen, Thiessen, I don't know how to pronounce his last name on predestination, that sort of talked about double predestination's role in political and authoritative sort of thinking, that this idea that the church would mediate your salvation and that Calvin resisted that. And part of the resistance was God's sovereignty. And in order to be logically consistent, God had to be the one to make that decision and, and the church could have no say in it. Did, did, did you, do you agree with that interpretation? Well, I think, I think, you know, Calvin has a very high view of the church. Uh, the church is the body of Christ. He also, he was a lawyer. He knew how to put together the institutional form of the church. And he believed very strongly that a community had to have discipline structure. He didn't name it as a mark of the church, but it was pretty much for him uh, a mark of the true church that it had discipline and order, which meant you had to have the consistory where people were brought up to uh, uh, answer for their behavior or you know, marital problems were resolved. So he has this view that the institutional life of the church is highly important uh, because that is the means by which the godly community is built up. But it does so only through fidelity to the word of God. It has no independent authority. It has, it's, it's, it comes back to the, you know, the question of the centrality of scripture. The, the church only has authority insofar as it professes the, the word of God. But within that, there are certain responsibilities that it has to maintain that body. So for Calvin, there was always a tension with politics because he wanted to ensure that the church could make decisions over the spiritual questions. The magistrates in Geneva were much keener to have control <laughs> over such questions. So there is embedded in Calvin's polity and vision of the church uh, already uh, a clash with uh, civil authority. And we'll see how that plays out in some of the discussions later on because those issues uh, crop up throughout the history of the life of the book. That's Bruce Gordon speaking about his new book, A Biography of John Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion. Bruce Gordon is a professor of ecclesiastical history at Yale Divinity School. Let's give people an overview of the Institutes in a nutshell. It's separated into four books. Uh, Let's talk about quickly each of those books. Um, What do we have in book one? What does that cover? Uh, Well, in book book one, you you have the treatment of the doctrine of God. Uh, which is 
<laughs> an enormous topic, uh, but Calvin uh, speaks about the, you know the, the essentially the name uh, the nature of of the divine. Uh, book two uh, treats on the nature of the the saving work of of Christ. Uh, in book three, you have the spirit on the treatment of justification by faith, and you have in also that's where you find the doctrine of providence and and predestination. And the outward forms of salvation, the church, is treated in, in book four. Uh, so you have there the treatment of the, the institutional forms of, of the faith. So it kind of gives a basic overview then, beginning with God, moving to Christ, yeah. through the Holy Spirit, the fruits of the Spirit, and, and the Christian life itself, which includes discussion of things like double predestination. And then book four, the church and sort of outward manifestation of what the Christian life looks like. And how did he do this? Was it mostly, um, was he citing scriptures? Was he, what kind of things was he doing to lay that case? Calvin had what he you know, referred to as the, the right order of, of doctrine, which was that he, he searches, and he talks about this in the introduction to the uh, Institutes of 1559. He, he said, you know, my search, my, my labor has been to put the doctrine of the Christian faith in the right order, which is a kind of the order of teaching, so that he lays it out step by step, so that those who are the readers, in which case for the, the Latin version, which would be students of you know, theology preparing for ministry, uh, would be able to follow it in a most straightforward way. But that's not just Calvin imposing an order on doctrine. He saw that, that order was embedded in scripture, uh, so that the order that he was seeking to replicate in his book is actually, for him, found above all in Paul's letter to the Romans, and that that is the right order of, of teaching of doctrine that he seeks to uh, emulate in this text. And he expresses a degree of, of satisfaction uh, that he's, you know, Got, got pretty close to what he wanted to, to do. So it's not, a, it's not an arbitrary structure, but there are other people whose works were highly influential on Calvin as he prepared the Institutes, and above all, Philip Melanchthon, who had been in Wittenberg and was a friend of, of John Calvin's. They corresponded extensively. And Philip Melanchthon's work, the Locke Communes, the commonplaces, was deeply influential on Calvin's own organizing of the text. But of course, it begins with with the, with this whole no question of the knowledge of God, and then proceeds through uh, a series of questions. And during his his many versions of the Institutes, he moves material around quite a bit, but he also uh, uh, he also adds to it considerably. He never changes the arguments, but he adds to it considerably as his reading goes on, as his study goes on, as his work preaching and, and teaching of the Bible goes on. The work expands. It's, it's extraordinarily dynamic. It never stays this, exactly the same from one edition to the next. Did he ever feel like one of them was sort of the definitive edition of, eventually before his death? I think the 1559 uh, Latin. Uh, it, there, it, it then appears in French the following year. But the 1559 Latin, he, he, he doesn't name it as definitive, but he certainly seems to be, I mean, by that point, he's a very ill man. I, mm -hmm. He didn't actually think he'd, he'd live to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so I think he, he saw this as the, the culmination of his work. And you've talked about a lot of the sources that he drew on and the fact that there was a lot of other literature going on at the time. So the question, a pressing question for your book is, why then today do we have a, bi a biography of John Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion? Mm -hmm. Why did mm -hmm. it stick around compared to all this other literature? Literature that that people usually haven't heard of anymore. Yeah, absolutely, a great question. Because you know, why has the institute survived? And I think I, I ask at one point in in the book, if if asked to to name a book from the Reformation, the institutes would be very high on the list of of what people uh, would say. Uh, I think there's a number of uh, reasons for this. I would begin by saying it's extremely readable. Calvin was a great writer. Uh, he sought. The, the virtues of lucidity and clarity. 
And he, in both French and Latin, he was recognized in his own day as an extraordinary stylist. Uh, French and, and Latin in, in, in the 16th century could often be very convoluted, long sentences, very difficult. Calvin writes in short sentences. He makes it easy on the reader's eye to follow the text. So it's a beautiful uh, book. It's a, it's a piece of literature. And there are not many of those that appear in the Reformation, certainly from the Protestant sides. You can think of some great uh, writers in, in the Catholic Church uh, from the 16th and 17th century. There are not that many in uh, the Protestant world. But it's also the clarity of it is expressed in the structure that we just spoke about. It lays out a summary of the Christian religion in a way that's ex extremely accessible and can be used uh, to teach across Europe and then soon across the Atlantic. Uh, it is a model of exposition and people respond very clearly to this. And I think there are other aspects you would add into this. Calvin writes it from a strongly pastoral sense. Uh, it's, it speaks to people of a powerful God, but of a loving God, of a Christ who is present uh, who invites to a growth into, uh, you know, as Calvin uh, frequently speaks of, becoming more Christ-like. It, it speaks to problems that people endure. So it's not cold theology, but it really is a book of the church. And in its own day, it becomes a bestseller. Uh, it's very well known. It outsells almost all other Protestant literature by a, a great distance. Um, and it remains uh, uh, very popular. But as what I try to show in the book is that it goes through periods where it's almost forgotten, and then it keeps enjoying these revivals. That's what's so interesting. I mean, it sort of hits like the Geneva Times best seller list, so to speak, and then it sort of drops off the radar, but then it comes back, and your biography talks about how the Institute's was understood and, and interpreted in the years following Calvin's death, and he died and was buried somewhere in an unmarked grave at his own request, uh, and, and his book continued to live on. Your book tells the story of this, so let's focus on, since we don't have a lot of time, but the book covers all sorts of different things, but let's focus on two different specific examples that I think people might find particularly interesting, one from America and and and, and then from South Africa. So first with, with America, the, the book and the author were seldom far apart in people's minds. And in the United States, Calvin has been hailed as by some as being the father of modern democracy on the one hand, yeah. uh, and on the other hand, as uh, an example of a, of a tyrannical leader who suppressed freedom of expression, if not belief, who was responsible for the, the uh, execution of a heretic. Uh, and so these are pretty different portraits. You have. On the one hand, you have this champion of freedom. On the other hand, you have this master inquisitor. Uh, where do these different portraits come from? What, what do you make of them as a historian? Yeah, fascinating for me because to see in looking at these texts, you think, are they are they actually talking about the same person? Is this the same life that they're looking at? And I think one of the things I, I wanted to do in the book is, is to demonstrate the ways in which Calvin was read very much reflected the changing intellectual, spiritual, uh, cultural conditions in which the book appeared. And in the 19th century, with the rise of liberal Protestantism uh, and the a new perspective on the Reformation. Calvin's a bit of a problem. Uh, how do you, know, in that liberal Protestant tradition, which is flourishing, what do you make of this person from the 16th century who seems so austere, who teaches double predestination, who, who has a whole range of views that do not uh, uh, agree in a particular way with what the liberal Protestant view of the 19th century is evolving as. And so they recreate Calvin because they want this authority figure from the Reformation. They, they recast him. And one of the ways they recast him is, is as a great author. They see him as this extraordinary uh, writer of the French language. But they also recast him, as you say, as a father of democracy, that Geneva belongs to a tradition that flows from antiquity, that what, what Calvin creates with the consistory and the institutions in 16th century Geneva is a sort of proto-modern 
democracy. Uh, and so they, they start to talk about this. And then when you get the anniversary of Calvin's birth in 1909, this is the Calvin that they, they venerate, this person who has created, in a sense, the modern world, leaving it aside and, or choosing to forget many of the inconvenient doctrinal uh, questions that separate them very much from that culture. So they've chosen to take this view of who Calvin was. And in many ways, uh, you know, many of your listeners may be familiar with the, 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 the wall in Geneva, the Reformation wall in Geneva, which has that uh, image of Calvin. Well, that was the world that produced this, this idea of Calvin, uh, the, the modern figure. At the same time, as you say, Calvin was remembered by many as the person who burnt at the stake Michael Servetus a man who denied, uh, or was thought to have denied, uh, the Trinity, a doctrine of the Trinity. And this is a, a, a long, complicated case. The two men had had uh, contact over a number of years. But in 1553, uh, Servetus, after a trial in which Calvin played a prominent role, is put uh, to death. He's burnt at the stake. And this becomes, for many people, a sign of Calvin's intolerance, that he is a tyrant, and that he has, that he made the uh, civil magistrates in Geneva kill this person. Well, that's it's not not the case, but it doesn't matter whether it's the case or not. This is what people thought he did. And so that created a long tradition, which I tried to talk about, where Calvin and his institutes were associated with tyranny, this horrible figure, the worst of the Reformation, the worst of religious intolerance. And so those two views, so you get many people in the 19th century reviving this view of Calvin as the intolerant figure, while others are creating a Calvin who is this voice of the modern world. And for both, they have very particular reasons for wanting to create that image of Calvin. It suits their own purposes for a variety of ways to have this tyrant on the one hand or this modern figure on the other. Uh, and that debate go goes well into the into the uh, 20th century and into our own time. Uh, two uh, quite different views of Calvin. You will still find books and articles on Calvin which see him as a modern figure. And you will find plenty of literature now that, that still speaks of Calvin, the person who puts people to death. The difficulty for any defender of Calvin there is the fact that Calvin, he may not have uh, lit the the tinders with his own torch, but I mean, he did facilitate that. He didn't oppose that. He 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 went along with that. How how do people say? How do people reconcile that with uh, people who see Calvin as this uh, sort of enlightened figure, a uh, democratic figure? How can they reconcile uh, with the fact that he really was involved with that death? Because it seems like you've got on the one hand this idea of him as this brave hero, freedom guy, and on the other hand this evil murderer mm -hmm. tyrant. Mm -hmm. Both of those seem to speak to what <laughs> they're, he's being weaponized for contemporary debates, obviously. Yeah, absolutely. Where does the historian come down on, to the extent that they can, on a judgment of the historical Calvin in his context? Sure. Well, I think it's, it's, it's like a lot of cases. You have to look at the details that I won't, I won't go into all of them. But just to say that for Calvin, he was extraordinarily reluctant in being drawn into this this case. He had known of Servetus for some years. He had famously predicted that if Servetus came to Geneva, he would probably die. Uh, so why Servetus actually came to Geneva in the end of the summer of 1553, nobody knows. Uh, there's, there's various reasons for why that, that happened. Calvin believed it was his task to defend the Orthodox faith. Because in the, you know, in the ancient world, the denial or the ancient Christianity, the denial of the Trinity was seen as a capital offense. Calvin saw, continued to believe that the denial of the Trinity as a doctrine was the most severe attack on Christianity and posed not only a threat to the doctrine of the church, but it posed a great threat to the community or the body of the church itself. He engaged in this trial demonstrating through a whole range of arguments that Servetus was a heretic, and very few people doubted that he was a heretic. Uh, he then ensured that the opinions of all the leading Protestant theologians were gathered as well. 
as well as the opinions of the leading Protestant political authorities. The, he and the council gathered these. They were unanimous in saying that Servetus should die. It was an extraordinarily unfortunate event, a great uh, difficult moment for the Reformation. Those who saw Calvin in a much more positive way in the 19th and into the 20th century would say it was a mistake. And one of the things they did just before the 1909 anniversary of Calvin's uh, birth was to issue an ap apology for that event. And they erected uh, a monument to Servetus in Geneva. And you will find this a Servetus Avenue in Geneva. There's, so there was, a, there was a, a collective confession of guilt and seeking to apologize that they realized that the only way they could continue to honor Calvin was by making some sort of apology for what happened. Right. And that's, that can be difficult to do for people who revere a historical figure to acknowledge uh, those types of difficulties and to still uh, – there's almost a forgiveness that has to be issued. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's yeah. it's really fascinating part of the book. It, does this play into it all some of the divisions between modern uh, followers of Calvin? I'm thinking, for example, of Marilyn Robinson, who we spoke with on the podcast uh, previously, uh -huh. as well as people like John Piper. Uh, I mean, they seem to be to have radically different Calvins. Well, I think he's he can be read um, in in remark. I mean, this this story that I thought to, to tell is. Is ongoing because you know I, I spoke about teaching a class a couple of years ago where we read the whole of the institutes and in some ways you know you could you could smile and say did did everybody read the same book uh, it was there they came to radically different conclusions about what Calvin was saying some of the old debates about not being able to accept his position on double predestination or uh, other issues um, but the, he continues to be. Uh, read in, in in remarkably different ways. Uh, you know, some people will find in him the great spiritual uh, teacher that in his biblical commentaries, uh, as well as in the Institutes, but in the wider body of work, that what's really striking about Calvin is his extraordinary pastoral sense. Uh, and for, for people like that, the emphasis on predestination, which is central to the way some people read the not just the institutes but Calvin's work uh, is is not how they see the reformer. Um, so there's he's he's capable of sustaining considerably different types of of reading, and I'm not surprised you know when you hear people come and talk about him in quite different ways. So that kind of talks. There's there's more to the American story, but that's just kind of a drop in the bucket there. Let's go to Af uh, South Africa. I yeah. was most impressed by the diametrically opposed uses that the Institutes was put to in South Africa. How did the same book manage to help some people justify apartheid and to help others uh, oppose apartheid and and maybe bring people up to speed who aren't familiar with uh, with apartheid? Yes, I mean this this. You know, dreadful situation in, in, in South Africa that emerged by the separation of uh, blacks and whites, which was, you know, which was, uh, you know, a, a great horror that lasted uh, until the, you know, at the time of Nelson Mandela being emerged from, from, from prison and the collapse of the system. Uh, that, that theologically, this was most problematic because many within the Reformed Church drew not only upon Calvin, but others in the Reformed tradition to defend this separation of the races. And I, that was the, the story that I really knew. Um, and uh, when I came to this, that, you know, that the, in the, within the Reformed church, there was this veneration of Calvin. There was a veneration of Abraham Kuyper uh, and other writers who were used to uh, teach a notion of separate spheres, which justified separation. What astonished me was a couple of years ago when Alan Bosa came to speak at Yale Divinity School and he agreed when I was teaching a course on the reformed tradition to come to the class and talk about South Africa. And he just blew me away and, and, and I think the students as well when he started to talk about how important Calvin had been in the resistance that how the, what they had learned, and I think, I think this quote quotes him uh, accurately, I hope, was that they realized that apartheid, this, this separation 
was a, in many ways a theological construct that needed to be taken apart theologically. And they realized that when they went to Calvin, that there was no argument in favor of this oppressive system. In fact, there were powerful arguments against any form of justification for using this work. And they started to read the Institutes. And I found, in, as, as, I, as I read more into what was being written, uh, extraordinary ways in which the Institutes was being cited, that Calvin was being named uh, as a authentic tradition of the church, which stood in diametrical opposition to what had been, you know, these, as I say, this oppressive system in South Africa. Uh, and that, um, for me, probably was the greatest revelation in, in preparing the book. I, I, just, I just didn't know that story at all. And, and uh, I found it incredibly compelling. To me, I, I agree. That was the most striking part of the entire biography of Institutes, was you had people who had been systematically oppressed uh, in, in part because of uh, – and justifications had been given based on Calvin's Institutes. You, yes. would, you would think that the people being oppressed would have no purchase with that work at all. Yet you have this figure, a, a black South African himself, embrace Calvin as a way to theologically turn the tables. Yes, yes. I mean he showed, he showed in many ways the whole basis uh, of, of – the theological arguments that had been made to be false, and 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 by reading Calvin and reading the Institutes and doing so in a public way, uh, Calvin became a voice for something very different. And absolutely, as you say, many people assumed that Calvin uh, that was was just part of an oppressive system, but it was this uh, other way of of introducing him that that was um, mind blowing. Yeah, the quote here from the book where you talk about this particular issue, you say that Alan Bosak told your Yale students that apartheid was a theological construct that had to be dismantled theologically. And that meant not going around John Calvin's institutes, but going straight through it. And yeah. it's quite a fascinating thing. Uh, that's Bruce Gordon. He is uh, the Titus Street Professor of Ecclesiastical History at Yale Divinity School. His books include Calvin, which is a biography of the Reformer, uh, and he also is the author of a new biography of John Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion. It's part of Princeton University Press's Lives of Great Religious Books series. We'll take a brief break and be right back for the rest of the interview. Thomas F. Rogers has been a student a teacher, a professor of Russian literature, a playwright, a Latter-day Saint missionary, mission president, bishop, and patriarch, a husband and father. In each circumstance, he's endeavored to lovingly negotiate the avenues of faith and reason. His new book is called Let Your Hearts and Minds Expand, Reflections on Faith, Reason, Charity, and Beauty. It's part of the Living Faith series from the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship. Learn more about Let Your Hearts and Minds Expand and other Living Faith books at mi.byu.edu slash livingfaith. It's the Maxwell Institute podcast. I'm Blair Hodges speaking today with Bruce Gordon, the Titus Street Professor of Ecclesiastical History at Yale Divinity School. And today we're talking about his biography of John Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion. Um, before the break, you mentioned a class, uh, a course that you taught at Yale Divinity School in 2014 on the Institutes, and your class included people from a variety of faith backgrounds or, or no faith or different types of traditions. And I'd just like to hear a little bit about what you took away from that experience that helped inform the biography, maybe some of the impressions of some of the students and what that experience was like. It was a wonderful experience for a variety of reasons. It started as a group of three or four students who came to see me and asked me if I would do a reading course in which we went through the institutes and I, I, I agreed. Um, and then word got around that uh, this was going to happen and it grew and grew and grew and I think in the end we were about 20 some. Mm. And we were in a fairly large room so we could sit in a in a circle uh, look, look all looking at each other and I drew up a, a plan, a kind of travel plan that, that got us through the institutes in 12 weeks or, or I think that's, that's right. And it was, so it was a lot of reading, but it was 
it was fascinating for a variety of reasons, one of which you, you, you named, and that is that uh, there were people from radically different backgrounds, uh, believers, non-believers, graduate students, people who were preparing for ministry, people, there were some people who, who audited, who were, had just come from outside the university, and we shared around the room in a most remarkable way. People were extremely generous with others in the way in which they read the text because they were reading the text uh, quite differently, uh, seeing different things in Calvin's words. And I saw my role in this was to try and give people uh, a fair bit of context to the book, not only Calvin's life, but the form of literature that it was, when it was produced, what sort of people Calvin was in conversation with, what were the, what were the battles that he was engaged in as he was writing this section, how the text was uh, growing as he added pieces in or moved pieces from one place to another. So I saw that as my, my central role. I thought my role was going to be to perhaps to be a referee, but that never actually happened. I, the, the, as I say, the courtesy with which people treated one another was, was, was terrific. And, uh, but I, I, I guess I didn't realize that uh, going through this, that I kept stressing Calvin's image of the mirror, uh, which, is, which he uses frequently as, as the, you know, the mirror of, of creation and God's glory, uh, because at the end of the course, they gave me a big mirror uh, to, to stick up on, on, on the wall. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it, was, uh, it, was, it was good natured, it was rigorous, and it was fascinating to see how a text evolves when you go from the beginning to the end, particularly when it's such a long text, because you can see how Calvin is reworking arguments. He's, he's returning to uh, material that he's covered before, but he's doing so in a different way with a different purpose. The text, I think, really came to life. I think that's the thing that we all found. It really came to life, no matter how differently it was being read. Uh, everybody was, was surprised by how they were drawn in by Calvin's brilliance as a writer, the way in which he structured the work, and the compelling way in which he put forward his arguments. Which is not to say they uh, accepted all of them, but uh, they, they all came away admiring the way Calvin wrote the Institutes. That's what was so interesting in the book. You quote from several of the participants who talked about being surprised by Calvin's pastoral concerns. They found him to often be sympathetic, having sympathetic insights to human nature. Uh, some people found it to be delightful. Another student wrote sort of a dear, he called it a dear John letter oh, to yes. John Calvin. Yes. It doesn't seem like he came away with much more love for his theology. Uh, so he just had this really cool mix of, of reactions in that. Yes. I think he says in the letter, I, I, he was a wonderful person. Uh, I think he says in the letter, I tried to love you, but, yeah. but uh, that it, it, didn't, it, didn't, it didn't take in that case. <laughs> So walking away from this project, this biography of a book, I wanted to ask one final question about what it's like to write a biography of a book in general. And this is something I've asked most of the authors of the Princeton series. Uh, we usually think of biographies as being uh, about humans. This is about mm -hmm. a book. So what did you learn about the nature of a book uh, in writing a biography of a book? When, when I started out to do this, I, I thought the one thing I don't really want to do is, is simply list editions and printing dates and, and, and where, it was, where it was produced and when. But I wasn't quite certain what I did want to do. Uh, and so as I, as I read and read and spent time thinking about it, what I came to, and I think this is what I, I took away from it, is, is the extraordinarily varied ways in which the book has been read, the extraordinary contexts in which the book has appeared, how important the Institutes has been for so many people, and how compelling an author Calvin has remained, even amongst those who, who find him uh, unacceptable, how compelling and powerful an author Calvin has remained you know, after 450 years. He, people, people still, as the class showed, people still respond to him passionately. And that says to me a great deal about a 16th century religious poet.
And finally, on the cover, uh, did you have any input onto the the piece that was put on the cover? Because it's it's pretty cool. It I, I I did I didn't choose it in, choose it in the sense of uh, I didn't find it. Uh, Princeton had a variety of uh, possibilities, and when I saw this one, I I thought this is beautiful. It's uh, by a Japanese artist. It's it's an image of the uh, flight into Egypt. It it catches a number of things that I thought the book tried to be about. That is the theme of exile, which is so powerful for Calvin, uh, and the the context, you know, the, the unexpected context of, of, of an Asian artist showing that Calvin has in his, this book a worldwide presence. It's very much part of a spreading tradition. And speaking of Japanese, you mentioned uh, before the interview that uh, you have a book that was just translated into Japanese. <laughs> yeah, I just found out today it's going to be. It hasn't been. It hasn't been right. made, but it's going to be translated. It, Cal, the biography of Calvin is going to be translated into Japanese. But as I say, I won't be doing the proofs. <laughs> yeah. Uh, any other projects that you have cooking right now? Well, I have a, a couple of things. One big project that I'm finishing is, is on the Bible in the 16th century. So that's another large topic. But uh, uh, I, I think my next big project will be to take on Zwingli and the early Reformation. Mm. That's Bruce Gordon. He is a professor of ecclesiastical history at Yale Divinity School. And today we were talking about his book, on John Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion. Bruce, thanks so much for taking the time today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you very much for asking me.